Right, good morning, everybody. Um, really, this talk may be a little bit worrying. It may also be a bit enlightening, which I hope that is going to be the case. We've heard a lot about what we should be doing in laboratories and the way we should be taking this forward. Um, I think there's actually a bit of a theme going on, and just to point out, in terms of EQA and collusion, David and I have not colluded at all on, on his talk and my talk, because I noticed that in his talk there were a number of uh, photographs from films, and I've got the same thing as well, so uh, there was no collusion whatsoever. Um, really, I think this may be a little bit worrying, and anybody who's of a nervous disposition, please leave now. Um, because I think, hopefully, this will become as a little bit of a shock to you all. So what am I going to talk about? Really, it's the best practice, or lack thereof. And really, do guidelines really work? So I want to do a very, very brief guideline survey. And this is just going to be a show of hands. And I would hope that all of you take part in this. I'm not going to be pointing fingers at anybody. I just want to get a gauge of where we're going with this. Then a number of you will be aware of that we've taken um, two flow cytometry surveys in the last couple of years or so, um, and I'll be presenting results from that. And those that are, are in the molecular arena will also know that we've taken and undertaken some surveys on chimerism, and I'll be showing some results from that. And you've probably guessed from the tone of where I'm going now that this may be not necessarily good news that I'm going to be showing you. So just, just one, one point here. Um, I've been involved in immunophenotyping since 1982 and um, really I, I was asked at a meeting recently have we seen any progress? I think this talk may tell you, give you the answer to that. So just quickly before I start, the top one on the top, this is to the flow, those that are doing flow cytometry. Could you all raise your hands those of you that are aware of this publication, the one on the top, please. Okay, that's great. Leave your hands up. Just leave your hands up for a moment. Can you put your hands down if you have not read these guidelines? Okay. Can you put your hands down if you've not fully implemented everything it says in this? One guy, one guy in this room has left his hand up. So that guy is telling me that he's implemented everything that's in this. Now, interestingly, we've got some of the authors in this room and they put their hands down as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the bottom one. The molecular people now. Chimerism. How many of you are aware of this guideline? Put your hands up, please. How many of you have read it? And if you haven't read it, put your hands down. How many of you have implemented everything that's in this guideline? Actually, I thought it was going to be the other way around. I thought the chimerism people would have all left their hands up. But hey, though, there was nobody that left their hand up on that one. That tells me something straight away. And this is begs the question that I'm going to, to put to you at the end. Do guidelines really work? Are we actually taking any notice of guidelines? And also, if we're looking at ISO 15189 as a, as a collective group going forward, as a UK, a lot of the emphasis in 15189 is validation and verification of your tests. And I'm going to be bringing something in later on. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with it, Euroflow. Um, and really, how do you actually validate and verify your tests, whether that be in flow cytometry or whether that be in uh, molecular genetics? Okay. So let's go. So, 2013, we issued a survey to 3,500 laboratories worldwide. Um, sorry, 1,583 laboratories worldwide. We've got uh, 3,500 3, participants in our program. At this moment in time, it's the only EQA program that is accredited for both uh, molecular and flow cytometry in the world, as I, as I understand it. But as I mentioned, we issued a, a questionnaire on the 15th of May 2013 to 1,583 participants. And that was open for just over a month or so uh, and closed on, in July. And there were actually 140 questions in this survey. Many of you in this room will have taken this survey. 
many, and I thank you ever so much for submitting the results and taking the time to do that because I know surveys are a pain in the neck, um, but it's the data from this survey that I'm presenting to you today, and I hope that you know, it's our feedback to you of what, what we're doing. Um, we actually got 33% respondents in, uh, uh, in this survey, which apparently in, in the field of uh, marketing is actually excellent. Um, and there were 335 uh, that completed the survey in full. And it actually covered a full gamut of, 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 of flow cytometry practices, from your views on UK NEQAS, uh, current laboratory practices which you're doing, leukemia immune, immunophenotyping, lymphocyte subset testing, CD34 stem cell analysis, low-level leukocyte counting, and, and, and PNH as well. I'm not going to cover everything in this survey. Um, I'm just going to be giving to a little bit of a talk to you over the current laboratory practices and uh, one or two of the others further down. Now, you've probably got the theme of this. Those of you who have spotted already, some of these are going to be, uh, the films are going to be horror movies. I think that might give you the, where we're going. So, the first question, one of the questions we asked was, how many staff perform flow cytometry analysis in your laboratory? And 20% of laboratories have only got one or two members of staff uh, in, the, in, the, in the world that do undertake <coughs> clinical flow cytometry. The vast majority of staff, fortunately, have got uh, between three and six members of staff trained to do flow cytometry, which is reassuring in a way because obviously we all know about staff absences through sickness, holidays, etc. And, and there are actually many laboratories, and some in the UK, that said they've got up to 10 staff that are able to do uh, clinical flow cytometry. We also asked, was there a plan to increase or decrease the range of tests offered by your laboratory? And we can see that about a third or so said that their workload, particularly in the UK, was increasing. Um, and the most common changes here that were planned were either introduction of MRD testing in leukemia diagnostics, testing of other sample types such as uh, CSF, lymph nodes, etc., lymphocyte proliferation assays, and FMH testing. Uh, which was one of the keys that was uh, areas that was coming through. So clearly, flow cytometry is still one of the mainstays within uh, the UK and within within pathology, sorry, as a as, as a means of uh, undertaking uh, diagnostic tests. But how are we doing it? How what machines are we using? Are we using multicolor analysis? Now. On the top here, we can see that most of us have got the, the, the newer breed of flow cytometers. Um, the fact it's Canto, the Navios, etc. And all of these have got multicolor flow uh, color capabilities. So they're easily doing at minimum six, possibly up to eight, ten or more. But one of the worrying things, and it's, I, I, I'm, I'm pained to say, um, that some of these are actually in the UK. We have got laboratories that are underutilizing their clinical flow cytometry, so much so that some labs are only using one or two colors. How do I know that? Well, recently we had an issue, I think it was with two or three laboratories here in the UK that we identified as having poor performance. And when we questioned their technique, I think two of them said that they were only either using one or two colours for their leukaemia diagnostics. As I mentioned earlier, I've been doing uh, immunophenotyping since 1982. I was using three colour back in 1988. And this lab did not know that three colour, well, two colour, was outdated. I think fortunately they've stopped doing the testing now and sending it elsewhere. But it is a little bit worrying. One of the other things that's worrying as well is the fact that not everybody is having their instruments serviced on a regular basis. Or maybe putting internal QC aspects into, in, into their systems that will alert us to having instrument issues. And then again, that's, a, that's a, another issue. So why do I mention that? Well, this actually was a UK lab. And we can see that uh, we'd expect something above this point here to be... Uh, of satisfactory performance, anything, any, any score above that. And we can see this lab was going along okay, and then we saw that they had a dip. And then they started to improve again, and then they had a dip. Then they improved again, and they continued on. 
Interesting that when we looked at the time points between here and here, it was one year. However, interestingly, the time point between here and here was also one year. And it was at this point here and here that their instrument was serviced. They'd done actually nothing in between their instruments being serviced to their instruments, neither checking it, calibrating it, or anything else in that time period. And you can see that as soon as the instrument was serviced, they became quite good again. And we actually got them to put and implement a, an internal QC procedure for calibrating their flow cytometry, and we've never had an issue since. So therefore, this really, to me, demonstrates the importance of having regular service on your instruments. Um, how often are the flow cytometers calibrated? Most people do it at service. Most people do it in not three months. Worryingly, 3% of you never calibrate your instrument. Never actually check what you're putting through your instrument, which is a little bit worrying. So we're moving away from what we're doing with our instruments, because obviously, if we're using an instrument which is poorly calibrated and poorly serviced, that's theoretically going to follow into what we're doing downstream with our diagnostics. So I now want to move on to, and this is, this is most of the talk is going to be around leukemia diagnostics uh, for, for this part of the talk, um, both for uh, flow cytometry immune phenotyping and mineral residual disease detection. <coughs> 164 centres submitted answers to this section. I think the three words in yellow highlight what this talks about. No two centres were using identical techniques. Nobody in this room is using an identical technique to, to the person you're sat next to if they're from somewhere else. Now, I'm going to talk about the Euroflow panel in a, in a few minutes. And I mentioned earlier on about validation and verification. And this is going to be one of the key focuses within ISO 15189. And it's basically how do you validate and how do you verify the test that you're doing? That antibody on the shelf, how have you validated it? How have you verified that it's doing what it says it does on the tin? How have you implemented it in your, your system? Now, I think it's, it's probably fair to say that we looked at this long and hard, and I think that the Euroflow panel, to my knowledge, is probably the only approach anywhere in the world that has been fully validated and fully tested for use by multiple centres. So that begged the question of, well, of the 164 respondents, we knew that 58% had got greater than 8 colour capability, that being the minimum to implement Euroflow. So we then asked, do you, uh, sp we asked specifically on a Euroflow section if it, this had been implemented or not. Now the reason why I say, and I'm talking about Euroflow, is the very fact that if from a validation and verification point of view, if you change nothing from what was published, that's basically, you're well on the way to valid validating and verifying your systems because they've validated fully and characterised fully the performance of the antibodies, machine setup, so on and so forth. Now, it is expensive. I accept that. But we're in a, in a situation where we have to get labs ISO 15189 accredited. And we found that only 4%, 7 out of the 164, this is worldwide, had actually implemented them fully. Um, interestingly, 23 labs stated they were, they, they were unaware of Euroflow. 14 were European. So, and I, and I, I think that the Euroflow uh, situation has been well published uh, at many talks. In fact, we had Jai Van Dongen here only two years ago talking about Euroflow. So it's interesting to note that um, it hasn't reached everybody out there. But if we look here at the Euroflow ALOT tube, and that's the acute leukemia orientation tube, this is just one tube. And it uses CD3, 45, myeloproxidase, 79A, CD34, 19, and 7 as the main screening tube. Interestingly, of the 164 labs, only 77% carry CD79A in their repertoire. CD79A is probably one of the most important ones alongside cytoplasmic CD3 and myeloperoxidase in being able to probably give you an immediate indication of the lineage that you're dealing with. 
So 77% of labs only, don't carry, oh, sorry, 23% of labs don't carry CD79 alpha. And those with, it was only slightly better with those which had got the capability of implementing the Euroflow. And again, we've got uh, the same with the, Euro, the LST uh, tube, the lymphoproliferative screening tube. But interestingly, the main take home message from this slide is that when you look at it, of all the 164, there was not 100% concordance on any single antigen, any single antigen that we should be carrying. No agreement. That was in 2013. Minimal residual disease detection. Now, everybody's probably trying to start minimal residual disease detection, and um, we, as you know, are run running several programs and piloting others as well. And we've had one that's been established for quite a while now uh, for BALL. And we actually wanted to know at what point individual laboratories started their MRD detection post-treatment and when they finished it. And you can see here that the first follow-up sample, some labs weren't doing it until 270 days later. Yet there were some labs that had completed all four analyses, all four tubes in that period, within 30 days of treatment. How on earth can they do minimal residual disease detection? But that was in 2013. Let's move forward. Let's move forward to this year. And in April this year, we issued um, another survey, primarily focused on leukemia diagnostics, including MRD again. And this time it was issued to 331 international participants. And we're still collecting the data and analysing the data at this moment in time. This time, there were 49 questions. And actually, we got an even better responding rate. We had 63% of labs responded. So we've got even better, more robust data this time. And as I mentioned, it focused on, on leukemia and immunophenotyping and MRD. OK, so this is a visual representation here of what we've looked at. And I don't expect you to uh, read any of this across the top. This column down the side indicates all the different antigens which represents those across the top. Now, the interesting thing is here, we actually asked internationally, what antibodies do you possess in your department, period, for doing leukemia diagnostics? And you can see that there are only three antigens, CD4, CD8, and CD10, where there's 100% agreement. There's close to 100% agreement with 3, 7, and 19. Worryingly, 5% of laboratories don't even carry CD45. So A, how do they do their gating? And B, how, do they, how are they guaranteeing that what they're dealing with is, is hemopoietic? But you can see this from this heat map. There's only one, two, three columns that are totally green. So that's the worldwide. In the UK, I hope that we do better. Well, we do, but not by much. We've got 4, 7, 8, 10, 19 kappa and lambda that everybody possesses. But interestingly, 45, not everybody in the UK possesses CD45. So again, that's quite a worrying situation. We are now, you know, probably 30 years on from doing leukemia and phenotyping where it became mainstream, and we still haven't got an agreement, 100% agreement, on all the panels that we're dealing with. So then what we did is we actually decided to ask specific questions with respect to how do you test your lymphoid neoplasms, precursor ne ne lymphoid neoplasms of B-cell lineage. This is all worldwide data. There's not 100% agreement on any antigen that everybody agrees we should do on B-lymphoid neoplasms. And if you're trying to find a green column, you can't. There isn't one. Apart from, everybody agrees, everybody agrees that on a B lymphoid neoplasm, we shouldn't do CD42B. That's that column there. Precursor lymphoid neoplasms for T cell lineage. What a surprise. No agreement. Everybody in this room has got their own particular unique panel that they've set up because they like to do it that way. But everybody agrees on T, uh, precursor T-cell 
lineage neoplasms, we shouldn't again be doing CD42B, and FMC7. And again, you, the two columns are highlighted. And this actually is the same story, apart from AML, where everybody agrees in AML we should be doing CD34. Not CD45. CD45 does not even figure on this list, as everybody should be doing, which is one antigen which I think should be coming through on every single one of these lists. B cell neoplasms, no mature B cell neoplasms, no agreement, apart from nobody does 41, 42, 61, and myeloproxidase. TNNK neoplasms, exactly the same as uh, the B lymph, B, B, uh, mature B cell neoplasms, apart from cytoplasmic CD22, nobody does this on T cell uh, and NK neoplasms, mature ones. But there's no agreement on what we should do to detect that they are of T-cell or NK-cell lineage. So we then asked the question of, well, OK, let's have a look at the ALOT panel, the Euroflow ALOT panel. Can everybody do the Euroflow ALOT panel? Because this is the only standardised, verified approach for doing leukaemia diagnostics. Whether you agree with this or not, whether you want to implement it or not, it's the only one that's going to help everybody out in terms of doing acute leukemias. 82% possess all the antibodies required to undertake the Euroflow ALOT panel. And the, as I mentioned earlier, we've got it's surface CD3, CD7, 19, 34, 45, 79 alpha, cytoplasmic CD3, and myeloproxidase. There's only 100% agreement in CD7 and CD34 in 2015. So we still not reached an agreement on all those that can do the European, uh, the Euroflow panel. Is it any better with the uh, UK? <coughs> the answer is probably not. Although we have now got agreement with CD7, 19, 34 and myeloproxidase, which is a start. We're probably a little bit further better off than, than uh, the UK. But then we've looked at all those that are using uh, a fax canto. Now, it's the, the Euroflow panel is really designed around the BD system. So we looked at all the labs that said they were using a BD system and were, had said what antibodies they were using. And you can see that about 80% of the BD fax canto users possess all Euroflow reagents. So we have 80% there or 70% there across the UK. Now, I probably, a bit um, like Martin Luther King, I have a dream. I, I retire potentially in three years' time, and wouldn't it be great if the UK could be the first nation in the world to all agree a panel? Doesn't it have to be the Euroflow panel, but everybody agrees that this will be the backbone of our leukemia diagnostics. And that you only change that once the committee has agreed that you can change that and we do it together. We'd be the first nation in the world that would ever have done that. Nobody else has ever done that because it's just, as you can see, a free for all out there. So that would be my dream within the next three years that we can achieve that from a UK perspective be the first country in the world that everybody says, this is the panel we're going to be using. Nobody's going to change that. You can add on your little fi favourites, if you wish, into that backbone panel, but we agree, this is going to be the panel, this is going to be how it's going to be run. I put that out there to you. If anybody's interested, I'm more than happy to talk. We then looked at the ILST panel worldwide, and again, only 69% possess all antibodies. Although it's a little bit better, we've got CD4, uh, 5, 8, 100%. But other than that, not everybody agrees. So it is a bit of a problem. We've still got these um, bit of a free-for-all out there in terms of what um, people are doing in terms of leukemia diagnostics and how they interpret and apply their antibodies. But this is in spite of all these guidelines and verified published uh, documents that are out there that people can read and adhere to. And in the UK, well, 
It's actually a little bit worse. Uh, we've got, uh, that actually should say LST, we've got 39% that possess all the antibodies and 66% of BD users uh, are able to do the uh, Euroflow LST tube. So I think we've still got some work to do in that area. But the big question is, the big question is, those that are doing, we ask them, we ask laboratories, are you doing Euroflow? And if so, can you tell us what your Euroflow panel is? So there were 82% of laboratories that stated they were using Euroflow, but they only actually possess, they actually possess all the antibodies for the ALOT screen tubes. In other words, these labs here, and it's laboratories down the side, all claimed they were doing the Euroflow. But actually, when you looked at it in more detail, some of them were clearly not even got the antibodies to do the Euroflow uh, ALOT tube, and certainly the Euroflow LST tubes. Interestingly, some of these are actually in the Euroflow consortium. And I actually uh, showed Jack Van Dungen and Alberto I found this data last week, and they were staggered. So it is worrying that people are actually taking part and have got published data out there and then going and saying, well, I don't agree with that. I don't want to do that. I'll change that because I want to put my serum rhubarb in there. It's better than what they've said. When we actually talking about the individual labs, which group was used as the primary information source for your panel development? We then looked at all those that said they used the Euroflow. Uh, and here we're looking at the four tubes, the ALOT, the LST, the plasma cells tube, and the small sample tube. And of the 42 that said they did Euroflow, uh, uh, well, in this instance, column is 42 labs, 34, 11, and 12, 15 claimed they made no changes to the tubes. Some were using the, using the supplementary tubes. They were only, uh, some of them weren't even using the correct flow cytometer. And um, there was only one lab that was using the correct screening antibody in both the SST and also the LST. Fortunately, this lab was part of the Euroflow consortium. Um, but it just shows that people are actually changing. It's saying that it's a bit like Emperor's New Clothes. Oh, it's all great, it's wonderful. We can see it works. But actually, as soon as the door's closed, off you go and do something else. But in reality, how, does the, how is this going to affect your accreditation? How are you going to verify and support all the information, evidence-based practice that your data is going to be sound? Because let's not forget that EQA is going to tell you a snapshot of time of what you're doing on that particular day. But it's down to you as individual laboratories that say that that and verify that that result is correct. So I'm hoping that, that David, who's following us this morning, will give us some insight into how they managed to do it, um, because I think these are lessons that we should all be learning from everybody else. But is it just the same in leukemia for immunophenotyping and diagnostics? Well, let's look at lymphocyte subset analysis. Some of you in this room will do that. Um, the interesting thing is here, how did you develop your normal range? Some labs used five samples and developed a normal range. Some labs used 30 samples and developed a normal range. But in actual fact, if you look at it statistically, you need a minimum of 100 samples to give 75% confidence, or 200, to get a 99% confidence that your normal range is going to be correct. However, and this is the interesting point that I keep talking about, and the fact that you Everybody reads these documents. Everybody, everybody reads these publications. How do you interpret them? Well, we asked a number of centres how they divine their normal range. Some said it was in-house, and some said it was publication. They used a publication to define their normal range. Okay? Now, the interesting thing is, we asked them what publications in this section here they used. Fifteen centres to a paper with paediatric rangers only, despite doing adults. So they were doing adult testing of CD4s, but using a paediatric normal range. 
Seven centres said, well, they used the normal range that were built into software. Two centres actually quoted a paper that never doesn't even contain normal ranges. Now, I think this one is, is an interesting one. 29 centres used a paper that was published before the year 2000. Now, why the year 2000? Why is that significant? Well, the significance of that is that it's around about 2000, for doing CD4 counting, single platform became the predominant technique as opposed to dual platform. It was the tipping point. But in actual fact, there are individual laboratories now, today, in this country, using a normal range that was derived using dual platform, but they're using single platform. So they've got a normal range which is this wide, but in actual fact, their normal range should be this wide because their technology is probably better. Some labs were quoting uh, use more than one normal range. 18, sorry, 80% 80 of labs use normal, more than one normal range, with 3% of labs using three normal ranges. So I think it's very interesting that you really must go away and look at how you've defined your normal ranges, and are they statistically fit for purpose? CD34 testing. Well, we published, uh, Alice and Whitby published on this. I'm not going to labour too much on this point, but what you can see is the ice age gating strategy is internationally recognised as being the way forward to doing CD34 stem cell analysis, stem cell enumeration. 42% of labs, when we surveyed them, were doing it incorrectly. They were either missing a gate or they were using the wrong antibodies, etc. 42% had taken the paper published by Rob Sutherland and Mike Keeney in 1996, looked at it, it gives you complete detail from start to finish, a bit like if you're making a cake at home, and they changed it. And then they were wondering why their technique's not working. They were wondering why we were identifying that they were poor performers. I doubt you'd change a method, uh, a recipe at home if you're making a cake. I don't know, you may do. Now, so then we looked at it in a little bit more detail. And the BCSH guidelines were published in 1999. I know they're a little bit old, but I think this still holds today. That the ice age protocol is still the best way approach to use. Single platform, which I mentioned earlier, because that's got uh, less, um, uh, it's got a, a better, a more robust CV. Use it electronic pipetting. Use reverse pipetting. And count a minimum of 50,000 events or 134 events. Okay. So if we take those six, five, six uh, points as being the mainstay of this is how the Ice Age gating protocol should be done in best practice, what do we get? Well, we looked at 148 laboratories. And the last couple of lines I put in there are uh, pipette serviced annually, because we know about that. We, I mentioned it to you earlier on, uh, and the flow cytometer serviced annually. So we know these are key factors in, in the results that we're going to get. So, number of laboratories, 148 we started with. How many satisfied that they did the Ice Age gating strategy correctly out of 148? 134. 91% of our starting population. Okay, we've got 134. How many of those are doing it single platform? Oh, we've dropped a few off. So we're now down to 83% of our starting total. Anybody like to say what, give a shout out what a number for the next one would be? Electronic pipetting? Just shout a number out. Well, it's got to be 123 or less. Anybody? 60. 60. 16. Sorry. 16. 16 laboratories had fulfilled the first three criteria. I think you can tell where this is going, can't you? Reverse pipetting, so they're using electronic and reverse pipetting, 13. They weren't connecting, collecting enough events. There were only 12 that were collecting enough events. Aha, now the killer. The kicker. How many are having the pipettes serviced annually? 11. How many are having your flow cytometer serviced annually? Also 11. So from the 148 laboratories worldwide that said they were doing the Ice Age gating strategy and using the Ice Age gating protocol, because it's a protocol that, that Rob and uh, Mike published, 
There's only 11 in the, UK, in the world that are doing it correctly. Now, the guys who are doing molecular, you can all wake up now. I'm going to talk a bit a little bit about molecular. So the flow cytometry guys go to sleep. Um, the, the molecular guys can wake. So um, we issued in July 2014, prior to publication of the UK NECWAS Chimerism Guidelines, um, a survey. And we got 23 questions to 108 participants. Um, and we had a very, very good response rate. Better than the flow, guys. I'm sorry, guys. 81% on this one. So, basically, what is the speciality of the laboratory? We can see that we've got labs which are primarily molecular and cytogenetic laboratories. Some are hematology laboratories doing chimerism. Some are histocompatibility and immunogenetics. And a small number of histology. However, which methodology you perform chimerism? You can see that some are using real-time PCR, some are using a commercial STR kit, and some are using in-house STR. Now, just dwell on that for a minute. I'll be coming back to that. Commercial STR kit. So the predominant feature is commercial STR kit. Now, there's a lot of vogue at the moment. Linear-specific chimerism. Let's go for it. Let's do it. How many are doing it? 74%. 74% of the labs are doing uh, linear-specific chimerism. And if so, what lineages do you usually routinely analyze? And you can see here we've got quite a wide variety of lineages that people are looking at. T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, NK cells, uh, myeloid. Um, and they've one here that says depends on referral reason. Okay. Um, any upon clinical request. So, now the interesting thing is, is do you check purity post-separation? And if so, how? 42% said yes, they do. They check your uh, purity post-separation. 47% of laboratories don't check the purity of, the t of your starting point. Okay. I think the slide says it all, really. 47% of you who do not check the purity of your sample actually have got no idea what you're testing. My lab checks the purity of every single sample, and I can tell you that you get a wide variety of vari variability in T cells. You think for one moment, if you're getting impure populations, how, are we, how on earth are we as, an organized, as a group of professional individuals going to give the correct data to our colleagues so the patients are treated correctly. I think that's got a major impact going forward on how we interpret linear-specific chimerism data. Because if it's not being checked and you're dealing with impurities, nearly 50% of us don't do it. Now, how much DNA do you put, input into each individual PCR within your assay? OK, some labs, about 10%, are putting less than one nanogram in their reaction, which is about 150 cells which actually is no better than the fish. And those using one nanogram, nanogram or less are probably following manufacturer's instructions. Why did I bring this up? Well, this particular test was developed for forensic science and for use at such levels. It means, therefore, that you've never validated it for use in your uh, setting because you need more DNA. You've got... A, a, you've got uh, um, the availability of putting more DNA in there. So why not increase that? Because it will have all sorts of problems. The question we're looking at now is, do those laboratories using such low levels perform worse in EQA? That's data that we're analysing at this moment in time. Do you calculate the limit of detection on each individual sample that show full donor chimerism? No. You'll quote it, but you've never done it. And what... In, what Internal QC samples do you run? 15% say none. They don't even run any internal QCs on your chimerism. So, PNH testing, 14 laboratories. Uh, we're using a method that followed the international consensus guidelines. And again, no two laboratories did the same technique. I'm not going to dwell on this because I know Neil's pushing me for time. So I think in conclusion, what I'm 
showing you today is that there's a, actually a huge variability in basic laboratory setup, both in flow cytometry and molecular genetics. There's still like a, a lack of real standardization across the UK and the world. Guidelines are probably read, but not fully implemented, or even implemented at all, or, or, or correctly. To us, on the data I've shown you today, there's no evidence of harmonization for leukemia and MRD testing, which questions is, is there really an impact? Are the guidelines really working? I think there's urgent need for full implementation of testing techniques and that provides standardization and harmonization. And what will, and following on from David's talk, what will ISO 15189 make? What impact will it make on us and our laboratories? There are a number of options that are available to ensure correct methodologies are in place. I think the biggest one is refer to publications, read them fully, and implement them properly. Everyone likes a B movie. Don't star anymore. I think that's the key. And I just want to leave you with this. Okay? How many times has I, on my UK Necro staff heard the fact that there are only guidelines? You stand up in court and say that when somebody's died. Well, why weren't you following the guidelines? Well, there are only guidance documents. Thank you for your time. Oh, just, just one thing. I, I nearly forgot. I must uh, mention Helen Whitehouse, who's done a fabulous job doing the, uh, the, the, the heat maps. And also Matt down here, a uh, really uh, uh, IT guy. And the three of them really did, did this talk for me. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was truly doom and gloom. I don't want you all to go to coffee feeling really, really bad. So I would draw some comfort from the fact that if you looked at one single test, such as the prothrombin type, which they started to standardise in 1969, Leon Fuller was definitely retired and was still ongoing and, um, with, with, with that, really. Um, the, other, the other question I, I would ask is, is given, given that disparity that you have revealed, how, how much impact really, really makes <coughs> in, 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 in an integrated reporting system on clinical diagnosis? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'll be honest, I really, really don't know. I think, I think the fact, the fact that, that we have we are moving, moving, moving to integrated, integrated diagnostics, diagnostics probably, probably is our is safety, safety in this respect because, because we can sit and sit and we do quite a lot of and we discuss this in a room, in a room, uh, 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 that's all that's all presented for us, and, 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 and we may ask to check, 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 but, but, I would expect that nobody's answered that level of diagnostic And, and you know, you know, these will these take a base value. value. And, and if we've not done it correctly, correctly. Um, um, then I think, I think you've, you've really got to really consider, consider what merit and merit those are. are. And, and I don't, I don't think, think that there is, there is going to tell in some of these things. It's not picking up the disparity. I noticed that it's talking about the actual result coming out of the system. I was talking about variability between everybody in this room and how the system is using. And, and it's my dream, my dream, as I say, as I said, hopefully, before I will type, type, probably get the get my, my, somewhere, somewhere, and we will look at, we will look at ABC, 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 and, and a lot of it is never evidence based. based. It's preferential actually and preference. preference. Okay, do we have, do we have one or two questions before we break for a skip for a skip for a skip?
Gordon and then come to a lab which don't do um, I think NECOS is always there to support. Um, I think that, that, is, that has to be the, the cornerstone of, of, of what any UK NECOS does. Um, and it should never be seen as, a, as, a, as the whipping boy or, 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 or the big stick, should I say. I think it, it is always very difficult, but I think it, one of the points that maybe, and maybe David could answer this, is the, is, is the it's ingraining quality. Quality does come at a price. It, it, quality is not cheap. And I think that, you know, we're all trying to cut corners, whether that be staff, whether that be uh, reagents, etc. But we have to ask ourselves if, if cutting corners is, uh, will that compromise the service that we're providing? The Royal College of Pathologists, I think, are doing the best they can. Um, and I don't think there's any right or wrong answer to this. Maybe David I, I might have something more to say on that. I, I don't know. Um, you could probably ask him afterwards if he's around. But I, I think that, you know, we've all, we're all in this together, and, and, and that's why I'm saying, from, from a UK perspective, there are enough of us in this room that have been in this game for a long time now, that have got the experience and the knowledge. You know, some have got much more knowledge than I, that we could formulate something that helps the UK and puts us at the pinnacle, at the very top, providing quality for, for our patients. Thank you. Um, is that, it's a quick question. This gentleman here. Uh, Joe? 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 Forward. Can you put your hand up, please? <laughs> Can I ask, are these microphones on? Can, I, can everybody hear these questions? Hmm. Can you hear me when I speak into this? Okay, so if you, if you ask, I'll repeat. Yeah. Uh, a comprehensive survey has been conducted why, uh, uh, um, on the use of Euroflow, but why laboratories are not using Euroflow? Has any survey been conducted on that? The reasons behind this? Okay, so the question was, is a comprehensive survey has been undertaken on Euroflow, um, but why are laboratories not using Euroflow? And I suspect the answer is possibly cost, because to be fair, to the, the, the Euroflow approach is designed around the Beckton Dickinson system, and you need other add-ons in there, such as uh, the software, the Infinisite software, and, and basically the Euroflow is trying to develop a uh, a database where you'd be able to submit your results and it would tell you basically what, di what diagnosis you've got based on your flow cytometry. That's the utopia. But my point here is, is well, okay, we know BD and, and certainly Euroflow, Jacques and Alberto are very strongly pushing this and going down this route and it, and it can only be commended. But those that are not necessarily using the BD system still need access to be able to do that. And I think the panels can be the backbone of what we adopt. And let's be fair, if you've bought an eight colour instrument, why not use eight colours? Why, use it, why, why are we using it for one and two colours? And I think, you know, we ha that you've got, you know, £100,000 plus machines sat there, and you're not using it to its capabilities. It's a bit like buying a Formula One car and just driving down to the road, and down to the shops and back every day in it. You know, you'd be want to be tear arsing down the road. Well, I would. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on that note, uh, thanks very much, David. <laughs> So uh, we, we, we break.